Hey guys again, uh, it's Alex from Mentoring Effect and I, I have with me Mike Ficker from Florida. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Welcome and I'm really happy you are here and I can't wait to share your story. Well, you know, thank you. First off, thank you so much for having me on. Like I said, anytime uh, I get to be a guest, it's, it's always humbling to be on and I'm uh, also at my own podcast, so I know I appreciate you taking the time uh, to do this. I know the work that goes into it, so it's exciting to be here. Yeah, thank you very much. And I will just straight away basically start with you. And uh, I will ask you probably give us some quick overview about your life and uh, yeah, just just who you are. <laughs> yeah, I'll give you the, the, the 30,000 foot movie trailer. Um, you know, former classroom <laughs> teacher, actually, I, I started my career in education as a teacher in the classroom, which is ironic because going a little further back, I was a terrible student, right? Barely graduated high school, didn't know what I want to do in college. And then <laughs> anywhere a teacher. Uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> so you, you become a teacher, that's a natural path, but I was waiting tables in a restaurant and one of my former teachers came in and said, hey, do you want to be a substitute teacher? And I went and, and I said, sure. It sounded like a good way, you know, to do, make money during the day because I waited tables at night and I fell in love with it, went back to school, finished, got my degree. I, I taught for the better part of a decade and then ironically enough, I went to get my master's degree in educational technology and right. when I did that, I, I went looking for a job. Uh, and, and I got a job as a director of an online school uh, for their curriculum, but it turns out that it was a startup and I didn't know it. Uh, so I had no intentions of getting involved in the startup or entrepreneurial community. I went in my car and cried. I tried to call my old boss back to try to get my old teaching job. I said no, but I made the best of it and we, we grew it to about 38 states uh, as an online learning platform and, and uh, it was actually a Catholic online school. And then we ended up getting investment uh, by a guy by the name of Wayne Heisinga, who was kind of like our local South Florida billionaire. He owned a couple of sports teams here in town. So like I got to fly on private jets and learn all these things. Uh, and I was promised everything under the sun, stock options, all this stuff. But I, I never got any of it, long story short. I was still always making just a teacher salary, but had a really cool job. So when that kind of ran its course, I decided, hey, I want to help businesses kind of not – make the same mistakes that, that happened to me, not over promise to people that are working with them. Uh, Cause this was like in the early 2010s. And then more importantly, I wanted to make sure that, uh, you know, I help businesses grow and scale in the right way. Cause I learned a lot from these guys who had grown a lot of successful businesses. So for about the last eight years now, I've been consulting as an outsourced COO, helping small to medium sized businesses grow and scale. So that's the that's the short version, believe it or not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have a lot of time. We will probably go a little oh, bit yeah, more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can tell you some good stories that happen yeah. in between there. <laughs> yeah, but it's interesting because basically you started from the first first job. It was already success, basically. And basically yeah. the, the, the startup ended up to be very successful. That means it's great. Probably you know what you're doing. And uh, I think that's very important. What was yeah. the, yeah, that was, that, it, was, that was leading you that way. Like it was hard. It was knowledge because you, that was your first job basically. Yeah. I mean, you know, and, and obviously I'd worked in sales before, like I mentioned, I waited tables. I, I worked at a place called circuit city here in the States, yeah. which was like a big electronic store, you know, so I'd, I'd worked in, in various sales. I, I'm, you know, I'm not going to say like I dive deep into business and I always had an interest in business, but I think being a teacher, really gave me the the skills on how to present something to somebody because when you're teaching right you have usually the most knowledge in the room and believe me that's always true because sometimes the kids are way smarter than i was but you kind of had a little bit of knowledge you were going to depart so you had to slow things down a little bit to teach those kids hey this is you know i understand the end result but i got to teach you how to get there right and that's all sales is right like the end result is usually somebody buying or, you know, investing in your program or hiring you to do something, but you need to educate them along the way. So I think when I started to get involved in the startup, they, they had actually hired a guy to do sales that they fired within two weeks because he was terrible because he was a sales guy, not an educator. I was an educator and knew how to present the product and the idea and get people to where I wanted to go. So I think that education background really helped me kind of sell yeah. better. And I still don't consider myself a good salesperson, but I, I love, like I said, I love kind of being the middle reliever. I love somebody setting the meeting. I come in and explain everything and then let somebody else close. I, I live in that, that middle area there really well, really, really Yeah, do, do it for me. <laughs> yeah, so always be the nice guy. <laughs> yeah, but it's interesting because you basically had to learn that kind of process that, uh, like, first thing is always everybody says um, that you need to be just one step ahead. Mm -hmm. from your from your audience that means you just need to know one step ahead or one step one step further 
to be able to educate them. And I think that's that's great because you had already experienced. Is that is that kind of true that you have experienced? Yeah, yeah. I, I think you know one, one step ahead. I think is, is you know it depends what you what you're doing, right? Like yeah, like if I want somebody to you know if I'm selling cars or if you're selling tangible objects, of course, you know. Um, it, it's just so, I think sales is so different nowadays because it really is relationship based, you know, yeah. uh, the old saying people buy from who they know, like, and trust. And I think just like in education, right? Like you could be the cool teacher. Like that was always the thing, right? You could be the cool teacher and like let the kids talk on their cell phones and text and let them do what they ever want and turn and work late and do all this stuff. But at the end of the day, like you didn't have any credibility as a teacher, right? You were just like somebody to let them do whatever they want. Or you could be the teacher that was kind of honest with that, you know, and then you had teachers over the other side, right? They were like super strict. They didn't let them get away with anything. They were just like, you know, overbearing. If you knew how to live in the middle, and I think the same is true of sales, right? If you know how to live in the middle, not be too overbearing, not be too lenient, like, oh, I know this is expensive or no, you don't want it. Like some people in sales are too wishy-washy. Some yeah. people are just too like in your face, hey, bye, 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 bye. Like we yeah. just had a, we had a product, one of my clients um, wanted to purchase an email list, right? Tons of companies out there. So we contacted this group and I'll tell you, we probably would have bought from the sales guy if he wasn't so pushy. Like he was just overly obnoxious and, and like he'd ask us a question and be like, Hey, I will get back to you. He went over our head and reached out to the client directly. It's just like, Whoa, you know, like slow down. So I think it's like, it's about relationship building, right? Cause even, even in teaching, you have to know the right questions to ask. So sometimes you even know the answer, not even being one step ahead, but knowing the right question to ask to understand when students are coming from, right? I taught ethics and, and I taught Bible and I taught psychology. These are all, philosophical subjects. So a lot of times there was no right answer. I just had, had a conversation with them and get a discussion going. And I think that's what helped me in the sales was I wasn't trying to get them to like two plus two equals four. I was just trying to get them to think, right? And I think if you do that in sales, you learn so much more by asking people questions and getting them to think. Yeah. You know? Honestly, you already say that it was actually amazing when you said that you were thinking to be cool cool teacher or you know yeah. give them actually something and teach them something and still be honest that means that's already like that's always what we say to people like know your audience know your yeah. ideal client know who you are selling to because that's all yeah. psychology as well and i know you had some kind of psychology back background as well a little bit yeah, means, yeah 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 because it's probably something you can use i guess a lot because we we do a lot of like a, like a disc and all assessments you know like you can do so many things and tricks with people and know actually who is in front of you and i think you said it already in a in a in a class that you had already that experience that you had to choose who you will be who you want to be for the kids or for the people that you were teaching because it's like you still want to give them the value, you know, that's another thing. Because if you yeah. will leave them on the phones, they're probably not going to get anything. That means how, how you will, uh, when you will mention something from psychology or your psychology background, how that is connected, how that is helping you. You know, I think it's, it's, it's a lot of understanding. Um, I actually, I've been talking about this book a lot because I, I read it recently. It's called uh, Never Split the Difference by Chris Voss. Um, he's a former FBI negotiator and he now has the, I don't know, have you heard of the book? I just, I know I heard about that, but yeah, I didn't, yeah, didn't remember the, you know, he has a company called the Black Swan Book and now he teaches people how to sell it. And I read his book and then also took his master class. And, and he talks a lot in there about the psychology and the techniques of like mirroring and listening to people and, and doing all these different things. And I think there's a lot of things, you know, innately, I think from a psychological standpoint, right? Human beings are, are very animalistic, right? We're all about survivors, right? You go into like, and even like with, with, with kids, right? When, and I keep referring back to teaching because it was my base, but like when a kid was in trouble, what did they do? They got on the defensive right away, right? Like, oh, it wasn't me or I didn't do that. Or, and they already had their excuse before you even caught them, right? Or they forgot their homework or didn't do, do whatever. Um, I think in sales, the same is true as well, right? So when we go to, to talk to a client and, and it's very, you know, you know the, the psychology of yes and no, right? And the power of no right? Like the power of like telling people no and, and the ability to do that. And Chris talks a lot about that in his book. I think understanding too, though, what's, I think if you really want to get into psychology and sales and, and people truly want to learn that it's what it does is it creates a little more empathy. And I think it changes the, the reversal of yourself looking at what you want and you're looking outward to what other people want, right? Like pick whatever technique you want. They all work, right? It's like diets. I tell everybody like yeah. <laughs> diet out there and the world works, right? You know how it works? if you stick to it, <laughs> like, yeah, exactly. it doesn't matter whether, what type of body type you have or anything like that. It's like, does keto work? Yeah. Does no carbs work? Yeah. You just have to stick to it for a long period of time, right? The same is true in sales. All these techniques work 
You just have to stick to it and become a master of it, right? You have to learn how it works for you. The problem is we go from like, hey, I read this book on sales and it said this, and then I'm gonna go to this one and now I change philosophies and then I start moving over here. Then I read the psychology of sales. Then I read Grant Cardone who told me just like close everybody, it's my up. Like you're all over the place, right? So what, what I tell everybody is I look at a lot of the education that's out there as a buffet. Now, if you go to a buffet, they're, they're, and, and my kids are funny because I teach them how to go eat at buffets, like when we go to Disney World and things like that. I said, you don't go up all at once and like pile your plate up, right? You see these people that go and just put everything on their plate and then they sit down. They don't eat everything that's on the plate. They look terribly like, you know, just, just exhausted from trying to get the $45 worth out of the buffet that they paid. I said, you know, education and what you're learning in sales is like a buffet. I tell my kids, let's go up for round one. Get a little bit of what you want. You want to get you want to get muffins? Go get like one muffin and, and some yeah. jelly and a little bit. And then we go up again and then we get like some meats and then we go up again and we get some eggs. And, then, and we'll spend a good hour eating there, but we do it a little bit at a time. And we learn instead of piling it all on our plate, nothing tastes good and you're exhausted. And again, I think learning the best way for you to sell is the same way because there's so there's there's almost too much knowledge out there now, right? Yeah. And I people agree. are like, oh well, I have to immerse myself in a philosophy. It, you could spend a lifetime learning how to sell. <laughs> <laughs> and you should, right? You should. It should be adapted, but you really got to pick the styles. And I think when it comes to psychology, you got to figure out what works for you and what you're comfortable with. Yeah. Because, you know, and yes, there is going to be a little bit of uncomfort to grow, but I think if you're comfortable, then you're really going to be able to understand how to reach out to people, yeah. how, to, how to connect with them. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Especially, yeah, it's a lot of information, a lot of knowledge out there. It, it's not even for free everywhere. It's, you know, it's online, you can learn so much, so many yeah. techniques. I think very important is to definitely have some kind of knowledge and practice in techniques. But also, I found out that I sell the best when I'm just honest, and I'm talking about what I really do yeah. and how I'm doing that. And I don't use actually any kind of technique. Maybe I'm, I'm using because that's the honesty. That's the creating of the relationship. Probably it's, it's really soft one. And I guess because I'm meeting a lot of people like that. And I, when you mentioned that, like the sales techniques, because they were, they were training and they were selling, um, they were telling you need to do like a cold calling, cold emailing and, and all that stuff, like plus something else. But I was thinking cold calling is not working for everyone. You know, like you can't cold call if you are super not comfortable. I'm not saying you, you shouldn't try it. I said, try it and you will see if that works. But on the other side, you need to also think about the other person, like who you are cold, cold calling, because there are people, maybe your clients are people, they don't want to actually hear any cold call, you know, and right. their clients, when you're selling probably printers or you're selling something uh, tangible to, to actually corporate, for example, I guess that's fine to cold call because they actually probably don't really need you. And it's yep. kind of a good place to do that. And I always, that's really interesting because that psychology, I think, and techniques and exactly what you said, people are getting overwhelmed. It's yeah. too many, <laughs> too many in one box. <laughs> yeah. And they all work. Like I said, you got to find that, like you yeah. said, you got to find that mix. Right. And, and this is the biggest thing. You hit on such a great point. It's like, you know, well, if you're not comfortable with cold calling and it depends, like does your industry warrant cold calling? It may yeah. or may not. And if it does, if you're uncomfortable, and this is, you know, the first thing I do when I start consulting a lot of entrepreneurs and business owners, I tell them, it's like, okay, you're not comfortable doing that. So you haven't been doing that. Yes. But if it's something that'll increase sales, like if I say, well, if you did made a hundred quote calls a day and it would increase your sales, like that's something you should do. Well, I'm super uncomfortable doing it. Well, that's great. You're going to hire your first person. Yeah. And that's what not, a, I, I think so many entrepreneurs miss with sales. You don't have that. Like I said, I like doing the middle part. So I I always partner with people that can do the appointment setting and they can do the closing because I like to do the, the pitch in the middle. I like to do the pitch and then I like to come in afterwards and say, hey, is everything running okay? That's, those are my two favorite places to live in the sales. Yeah. Like in the middle in the middle pitch and then like, you know, during the implementation. I, That's where I love to live. So I hire people in the other stages because I don't like to live there. And yeah. not enough entrepreneurs do that. They feel like they have to take it like from the womb to the tomb and i'm like that's just not true you know you, you really have to learn how to outsource this. and and most successful sales guys even if you look at the grades they do that right they're not they're not they're not co-calling 100 people they're waiting until leads get warm and warmer and warmer and warmer and they either come into the close or you know they come in they come in at the point where they do their best work and that's really the secret to sales find where you do your best work and outsource everything else around it yeah I would like to ask probably more about the, about your business right now. How yeah. long have you been in this business, in this company? Yeah, so uh, I've been uh, doing the consult business development consulting for about eight years. I started, uh, when I started out, I started primary, primarily consulting for educational companies. 
So when I first started the company, it was called Classroom Today. I also had a partner who was very deep in the education space. And we started really consulting just for educational businesses because that's where my yeah. background was. Well, you know, about two, three years into it, we started to really get recognition that we knew what we were doing. And then we were also developing a lot of training for these companies and or for these educational companies. So we started to connect with like larger companies like NEC, Conica, Minolta. I did a project in Israel with Noble Energy. Um, so we started to develop training for other companies that, that were outside of the education space. Yep. Um, and then really about, uh, I would say about two or three years ago, my partner wanted to take the company in a different direction. I didn't want to do that. He was kind of the closer guy too. That's where he lived. Um, and, and great guy. We still have a very good friendship. Um, but we just decided to kind of split up. So he went and kept doing most of the educational thing. And now I wanted to continue to work with yeah. a variety of different businesses and focus more on the marketing side. Because marketing is really interesting to me. So about uh, three and a half years ago, I started the Mag Group as kind of a solo, partnered up with a couple of different people that were very key. Uh, I did very well in product management and marketing. Because I wanted to focus on three key areas with marketing, sales, and implementation. So I kind of have yeah. you know, been able to partner with and build a team around that. And, and it's yeah. really been most, a fun Most journey. important. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 100%. Yeah. 100%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. We, we started a conversation about sales. I just want to go a little bit there because you said you started eight, eight years ago. When you think about the beginning, like how you will, how, if you remember, how did you get like your first clients? Because you said somebody is doing close, uh, closing the business for you right now, but, but how it was there? Because some people are starting now. It's really, ironically, it's all been relationship-based. You know, even yeah. eight years ago, I would say, like, you know, you're looking around 2012, social media wasn't as big. I'm still active on, you know, various social media platforms, but it was just through relationships, right? Um, people have always said, hey, I see what you're doing over there. How could I work with you knowing small businesses? It was just kind of started doing the work. And to be honest with you, I've been someone who's been very lucky throughout my entire career. You know, most of the business I've done, I've never had to go out and, like, cold call or prospect or do anything like that. Most of the business I've gotten has come through word of mouth or referral or, you know, just by the content I'm putting out on social media. Yeah. So um, it's been, you know, when I look at getting those first clients, that's how it started and it still starts today. And that worked for me, right? Because yep. it, it's very kind of niche what I do. It's very, there, you know, it's not like there's a lot of businesses that, that I would be able to do this with. Um, but I will say, working with some businesses and helping them find their first sale, right? Or their first customer. Some of the startups I work with, you know, even in the education space, when I was developing for a lot of education companies, it's so difficult because even when we're giving stuff away for free, <laughs> it was like, yeah. well, how do we know it's going to work? Well, how do we know this is going to happen? So I would say that like the feeling of, you know, it's funny. You, you almost don't remember your, your wins as much as you remember your losses, you know? Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> because I think it's more, I could tell you probably more things come to mind as you ask that question, which we're talking about psychology is kind of ironic of the times we presented and we didn't get the yes, you know, I'm like, well, you guys don't have this. You don't have, there was so much more. I think I learned in those processes, um, you know, and, and don't get me wrong. The wins are, you know, I, I can refer back to some of the wins, some of the first sales and some of the first partnerships, that we got for distributions with large corporate clients. But oddly enough, those losses stick in my head a little bit more because I think that's where I learned the most, you know, it's more yeah. from that than the wins because it was like, oh, because, you know, even if we got, got a win and you got a little bit of like, hey, look at me, I'm, I made a sale, I'm the man. You know, you want to make sale number two the same way you make sale number one. Yeah. You're like, I am not the man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it's interesting. We always actually learn, and exactly, we, we always remember these bad things because that's probably something that you that helped you to change. But yeah. I'm actually curious about that when you when you're talking about that because I, I yeah I was I was actually going to go there a little bit. Like you still yeah. you, you said you said first thing that you actually had sales based on relationship or you know what you were doing on social media and that means people knew about your business that means you were actually showing showing up every day you were there yeah. you were probably networking i guess or you were doing some other maybe maybe some events or something <laughs> well what it's funny that? because no one really knows what i do right so like um <laughs> you know one other thing and, and oddly enough i've been really bad about this during covid i think just because i've been busy and we've been we're talking a little bit before the show about not working in my office coming and working from home a little bit more um, you know, I would take my kids to school, drop them off, be in my office by like 7.30 a.m. And then I would like record my live show. I would do a lot of things. But now, like I tell everybody, working from home, the hardest part is to commute, right? Because you get up, there's no kids to take to school. Everybody wants yeah. breakfast, you get them slow. And before you know, it's 8.30 in the morning, you know, 9 o'clock. So, uh, you know, 
to answer your question, it was, it's really just kind of about, I, I started to get this reputation of like, well, Mike knows business, right? Like Mike understands business processes, but it wasn't like I was like, because I wasn't selling a widget, right? Like if I was selling accounting or I was a lawyer or I was, you know, selling a, a you know, a phones or whatever, or, you know, wrenches or whatever it would be, I think people would know that. But what I would do is I would get on and you're, you're going to laugh. I get on every week and I, like I said, I've been really bad during the COVID and I would go live on, on Facebook for about 15 minutes uh, and I would just do a little dance in the beginning of my video, sitting down in my chair, I play a song and I do a little dance. Now in real life, I am a terrible dancer. I was, I was uh, <laughs> having this conversation, like, like if I go to like out to, to a place, I'm not dancing. I'm, I'm the guy sitting on the wall. My wife's the one out on the dance floor with their friends. But I would just dance in the chair, do something a little silly, just to kind of like get everybody going. And then I would put in the title like, hey, you know, my business philosopher that day, like, you know, the best way to retain customers, whatever it is. Now I tell you of like the, you know, whatever views I would get, 90% of those people probably didn't watch the video, right? But they saw me dancing. <laughs> I'd say another 5% probably, you know, maybe listened for a little bit and then got yeah. off and the other 5% probably listened again. But everywhere I go, whether it's a convention, whether it's a local event, whether I do go networking with my local chamber of commerce or whether I'm at a national convention or whatever it is in a pre-COVID world, um, someone would come up to me and be like, you're the guy dancing on Facebook or even in the supermarket. I went to the supermarket the other day with a mask, sunglasses, and a hat on, and somebody said, you're the guy that dances on Facebook. <laughs> so <laughs> oh, I, I guess I can't rob a bank because yeah. people knew who I was, but that consistency of like that little hook. So really the consistency of putting those videos out and, and that little hook of me dancing, like I said, dancing is not something I'm good at, but I, I did it once on a video. And it's like, I've been doing this for almost like three years now on the video and people recognize me for that. But then also I attached it with my business knowledge. So it opened up the door for the conversation. It gave me, you know, people knew that, Hey, Mike's involved in consulting and helping small to medium sized businesses grow. I don't quite know what he does. I just know if I'm in business and I want to grow, I need to talk to him and, and I've gotten clients from it. It's been an amazing process. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much for saying that because that's, you just wrap up a lot of, a lot of important things. And there was a lot of knowledge in what you just say. And there was the first thing was, uh, yes, uh, we always say people to have some kind of ordinary story. And I actually started my videos with, uh, Hey guys, do you love pizza? Or did, did you travel? Have you been in Italy? Or, you know, like I was trying to bring people into some different places because I love traveling. And yeah. it's funny how that I saw the, the results on Facebook uh, when you measure the videos and, and checking who actually sees your video. And there was more engagement in that video and people actually watched the video. And I posted a million other videos and other advertisement and they didn't even see the five percent of the videos. But this one with pizza and with just some s small ordinary thing, they totally like they watched the video and I was like, wow, like that's great result because that's very visible. What you said that people will remember you for something that you did and it was dancing and you, you were consistent. That's another big thing because this yeah. is it. Everybody starts. And I think you have same experience, I guess, uh, with other people. They always started as so excited and it's like, yes, let's do it. I will do sales. I will do marketing, but it kind of like slowly disappearing. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a week, two, three, sometimes month. Someone can do it for a year. And I think that's amazing. That uh, what, what is your, when you think about that, what you just say, and what are maybe more, or what it, when you think about characteristic or attitude, what you, will, what you will say to people? Like what else is really growing your business? Because I know now it's consistency and it's maybe something, yeah, you know, I, audience. I think you know, and you, you had on something there as well, right? Talking about the travel because it's something you love. Consistency and, and authentic, authentic, being authentic. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> don't try to make big words you can't get them out, you know? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I just feel like too many people get on there, you know. And listen, I mean, part of me feels kind of cheesy talking about entrepreneurship because I do feel like everyone's doing it. And sometimes I feel like, what the heck have I done? You know what I mean? But it's just, for me, I don't do it. And, and to be honest, I really don't do it to generate business as much as I do it to, to, to document my story. You know what I mean? And I feel like it's important to share it. And then, and I, and I've had people, like I said, come to me and talk to me about it. So I think it's, it's that authenticity right now. Like I'm not, my advice is not to dance on social media because that may not be authentic for you. And like, it may not work for you. Like it just, it works for me, you know, like, I mean, it just, it's, it's, it's helped me get out of a few jams even like, believe it or not, like it's just, <laughs> it, it's let me lighten the mood It's up. good energy. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and it's just, it, it's been fun. I say I'm a professional chair dancer, you know? It's just, um, but it has to be authentic for you, you know what I mean? Like some yeah. people, like, 
and, and, and you see it, right? Like some people will put their kids on video and you can tell they're just like forcing it, right? And it's just like, mm, doesn't work, right? Don't but some people put kids on video and it's like, it's perfect because it's like, they're not trying it, it's an accident. And you know, it's funny because I had someone call me yesterday, a buddy of mine, and he's like, hey, how's it going? And he wanted to find out about partnering with one of my clients and I'm talking to him, I'm like, you know, it's funny. I'm like, I'm like, I'm great. Like, like I, you know, you know, thank God my business, my family, everything's you know, been going really well through. So I said, isn't it funny that, you know, the businesses I work with, the people I work with who, who are doing the right thing in their business, who are making the right choices, even during this, the toughest times, right? That we're all going to remember this is the toughest times are thriving. Yeah. Why? Because they're doing the right things and they're being authentic. Right. Like, and, and to me, there's nothing wrong with making money. Like, and believe me, I tell everybody, I got, I got four kids. So I'm the first one to tell you, like making money is important. Um, <laughs> like, <laughs> but how do you want to be in business if you don't want to make money? Yeah, you can't like, everyone, you, you can't just get out there and do good. Like everyone's like, Oh, I want to give you equity in the company. I'm like, I can't see my kids equity flakes. All right. I'm like, we can yeah. talk like real money. Like I need to get paid yes. plus equity only because it's like, that's what you need. But that being said, if you're just going in the business to make money, your odds of succeeding are not as good. I won't say, because like some people say, oh, if you just go into business and make money, you're going to do well. Listen, there's plenty of people out there that are, that are not the best people in the world that are making a ton of money doing the wrong things, okay? So like, let's, let's put that out there. Doing the right thing doesn't always win. Sometimes yeah. doing the wrong thing wins. That being said, in the long run, in the long term, you know, you really got to look at doing the right thing, but then also looking at ways to monetize because, you know, and sometimes too, is it a business, is it a hobby or is it a charity? And you have to yeah. ask yourself those questions because sometimes you may have figured out something great, but it's just a hobby and it's not going to make you a lot of money. Maybe it's a side hustle. Yeah. Um, and sometimes you've got a great business or sometimes it's just a charity and the charity is not going to make you money. You just got to work it as a charity. Yeah. And, it's, and it's difficult for people to see that, right? Because a business is like a child. It becomes like your child or your pet. It takes on this meaning to where like you love it so much you can't let it go and you'll do anything for it no matter what even if it like you know poops on the road yeah <laughs> it's, it's so true <laughs> i absolutely agree it's just yeah, yeah, yeah. We, especially now when, when you're working with people and you're trying to help people like we have amazing jobs i think this this industry is amazing like we can help people that's that's the coolest thing and you can still make yes. money but that is really the the it's kind of like a border you need to know where to stop to just give away, give away, give away. And you really re need to think about your strategy because that's, that's what happened to me. Like I was giving away all sessions and everything and I ended up to coach people for weeks and months and uh, some, one of them for, for half a year, you know, and that's for free. That means you, you, start, you need to really think about that exactly if your business is business or is a charity. Because if it's a charity, yeah. you can probably just hire a few other people that want to work for free and just, just help the world. That's, that's great. But I guess also with money, you can help people a little bit more and you can help the world a little bit more. That's why people need to understand they still need to make money. And I think it's that relationship with money. Like that's probably, that has to be really positive. <laughs> yeah. And, and I think you have to understand, right? Like it's because, and, and there are times in business where you have to, like I have a client that was rolling out a new product and we had to, you know, go to a couple of businesses and give it away for them and shoot footage and, and create content and do all that stuff. But there has to get a point where you have to know where to draw that line, right? And then you also have to know that, like, you know, yeah. some people don't want to give anything away for free. No, I got the best thing in the world. I want to be able to listen. Sometimes you got to get paid, run a beta test. We got to get proof of concept. Yeah. So, you know, you hit a great point. It's like knowing where that line is, you can only, and especially in the independent consulting and, and, and you know, and, and I believe too, you know, I do think so many people don't realize it. And I know so many people have lost their jobs during this time, right? And I think you're going to see a shift, though. You're going to see, I think, the, the great thing about that, you're going to see a rise in consultants, right? Because here's the thing, there's going to be so many people that were in these corporate jobs doing like a niche, a niche task or a niche assignment or a niche, niche project. They got let go that other businesses also let that person go. And they're going to be like, Hey, we just need someone for a few hours a week to tell us how to do task B. And this person knows how to do task B better than everyone else. So if you're making a hundred grand a year, you may be able to get 10 clients that pay a thousand bucks a month that'll, that'll now, you know, you'll spend like maybe an hour, two hours a week on the phone with them. I mean, the ROI on that's pretty huge. Right. And I think we're going to get to that. I think what we're going to realize is where everyone was going broad. I think a lot of people that were going broad and not niche are going to have a hard time in this transition But people that are going niche and are able, like you said, to tell their story, do the right thing, help other people get involved with businesses and say, Hey, I just, I know I'm really good at you know, process ABC, and I'm going to just start talking about that on LinkedIn. Start talking. Like, if I was unemployed yes. right now, I got let go from a job, that's what I would be doing. I would just be like, yes. hey, 
you know, I lost my job because of COVID, but this is what I used to do with my job, and this is what I miss the most. You know, I was a systems analysis who did blah, 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 or whatever, whatever you were. Like, yeah. I mean, you were a cashier. Like, I was a cashier, and, like, one of the things I learned is, like, if at the register, I told everybody, hey, you look really good in this. You should get the blue belt because it goes to the pants. You're now a consultant. You're now an expert. I think so many people feel like they have to, you know, teach people how to be millionaires, right? And I always tell everybody, I do not, I do not want to be a millionaire, right? That is not my goal. I don't want to be rich. I don't want to be filthy rich. I said, I want to be a dollar all right, because I know, I know plenty of people who are millionaires who are also a million dollars in debt, right? So that's not being a millionaire, right? Like, and, and I think my father said this when I was a kid once, and it was so profound. Most people's goal is not to be rich. Most people's goal is to be broke because they're so far in debt, they're trying to get to zero, right? So the goal should be to be broke. The goal should be at zero. Like when you're broke, that's awesome. Like let's get to zero. Then from zero, you can start building wealth, right? So I want to be a dollar I want to have enough money to be able to pay for whatever I want, do whatever yeah. I want. You know, I, and listen, and, and not that I didn't go through this phase where I wanted the nicest cars and the, the biggest houses and all that stuff. And, you know, yes, because of my success, I've been able to buy some of that stuff. It's a little easier to say now. But on the same hand, I realized that, that that stratosphere that, you know, the Instagram success of the Lambo and the Ferrari and the boat, you know, if you want it great, there's nothing wrong with that. But if you could learn how to create a lifestyle by design and, and, and create this, what yeah. I call the dollar lifestyle to where you have enough dollars to like, like, like if I don't want to cut my lawn, I'm going to pay somebody to cut my lawn. Not because I'm lazy, but because I'm buying that time back now because I'm a dollar there. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's, exactly. That, to me, that's, that's being successful. That's, that's the win. Like that's the success I'm shooting for. And that's the success. I want where people who understand that level of success they're striving to that more than like, hey, I want to do $3 billion this year. It's like, okay, that's easy. You know, like, <laughs> that doesn't I mean, mean anything. Like, yeah. Tell me, awesome. tell me the impact you want to make. You know, tell me. And, and I do. I work with a lot of, you know, I work with female entrepreneurs that, that want to spend more time with their kids. And we design a system in their business where they can still make millions of dollars a year and spend more time with their kids. Or like you said, you want to travel. Well, how can we design and, and structure your business so you start working a little bit less, produce a great product still, and have the time you want to travel and enjoy it, you know? And, and you don't have to hustle. You don't have to burn out to be successful. You just need to learn how to play the game right. You know what I mean? And, and that's where the win is. Sorry, no, I'm not you are, no, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> that's cool. You already answered my question. That means we know what, is, what success means for you. But, but what is very important, I guess, it's uh, what, what you said is amazing because a lot of people, even new clients, sometimes they come to you and they're like, okay, it's like, what do you want from life? But they're like, yeah, I want to make this 1 million, you know, in one year or, or 200,000 a year. And you're just looking at them, how much are you making now? And it's like nothing. It's like, first of all, I, it's beautiful. Like I, I said, I'm not taking anyone's dreams away. It's great. But let's plan also the time, how, much, how many hours you want to spend in business and how many hours and how much you want to work. Because to get from zero to million in a few months, it's maybe doable, but you need a huge team. You need so much work and you will probably work 24 seven. And let's be honest, you have to. It's just, it's crazy amount of work to get that money, especially it's all different industries. So that's, that all depends on what kind of product you have, of course, and what you're selling. I guess, you know, if, you, if you're selling a car that is costing you, uh, that, that um, sales is two million, you know, and costs one million, you probably can make it in one sale. But all depends what you're selling. But also when you look at the people, like at the end, when you talk to them a little bit longer, it's not about money. It's, it's not about, because that's great. Like money will buy you some stuff, but it's not at the end, when you're going a little bit deeper, it's not about money. They just, they have totally different fulfillment. And some of them find out like they actually don't want million dollars. <laughs> and that's yeah, the funny probably. speech, you know, it's like, well, you came to me you want one million dollar, but now you found out that that is actually not the the real goal. <laughs> like there is something else, and exactly what you said: spend more more time with family. That probably you shouldn't have huge business if you want to spend more time with family. You should think right. about what you will do, and maybe it will take you five hours a day because you want to spend time with your kids. And I guess you know that's that's how you need to really approach that. And that's what you said: just really look at that. What do you want? What do you really want from life? Yeah, I mean, and, and even too, like, my son turns 13 this year, and I mean, it's like, there's five years left in the house, and like, if you came to me, like, what are your goals? Like, well, yeah, I mean, my goals to be well in business, but do I want to miss the, the, the last five years of my son being in my house? No, I'd rather, like, maybe, I want to work hard, but I don't want to burn myself out, and then when he's out of the house, and maybe, yeah, then, then I want to kill myself a little bit more because I'm going to have more free yeah. time, you know what I mean? So it's like, it's that lifestyle by design, I think most people don't understand. It's like, you know, yeah, you could grow a business, you get a five years for a multi-million dollar business, and then miss yeah. teenagers or your kids. 
you're never going to buy that back. You know what I mean? And then what yeah. do you try to do? You try to leave with, relive it with their kids. That's not, those aren't your kids and your kids aren't going to want you to do that either. So you only get one shot at life. You know what I mean? So it's like, make the best of it, you know, figure out what, figure out what's going to make you happy first, you know, and then find everything else. And listen, like, and, and we said this already on the show, right? Like money is important. Like I, and believe me, I have corporate clients where like the goal is, is the dollar not, Hey, we need to get more leads. we get more money make the investors happy to sell the company. Great. We can, we can work that system. But, but like you said, when you're the solo entrepreneur, I, I love the solo entrepreneurs. I'm like, Hey, I want to make a million dollars a year. I always ask three times. Why? And they say, well, you know, like, I really think that's a lot of money. I can do a lot of it. Okay. Why? Well, you know, like if, if I had a, and eventually by the third why I usually get to the answer, right? Because usually it's like you said, it's time, right? or it's like, hey, I want I want to f you somebody and prove to them that I can do it, or it's yeah. it's just that they want they want a shot. What is the reason? Yeah. Yeah, I want to show. Hey, you want to buy a label for two hundred fifty thousand dollars? All we got to do is make two hundred fifty thousand dollars. We're not gonna make it. Back. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, so you want to buy a label for two fifty and you need to make one hundred twenty grand a year? We can make half a million. You're good to go. You know, like yeah. it's it's. it's a lot of people don't understand. That's why I mean this whole, I, I love the dollar air philosophy and I'm actually working on a book about it. Um, it is that you, you have to find really what is the end goal of what you want and what's going to make you happy. And like I said, sometimes asking that why three times always gets me there because it's just like, I'm just like, all yeah. right, why, why? And then by the third one, I'm usually there. And then if I'm not, it's, it, 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 it may not be a fit for us to work together. So it's, it's a yeah. great that's, Very easy to do too. Yeah. yeah. That, that's another thing that why people should understand I guess that ideal client is important because you don't want to work with everyone and yes. you really want to help people to fulfill probably, probably even like a right dream for you because you, you actually helping them fulfill something, but you will, you will find your purpose in their goal as well. And I guess that's, uh, that's very important because I, I can't imagine, I can't imagine to work with someone just, just working for money and having just million cars and, and nothing like it has to be a little bit deeper because it, my programs are going actually a little bit deeper into values purpose as well. And, and I love that about life and how that changed my business. That means I'm, I'm trying to always show people like, this is more important, like really think what you want. Cause yeah. if, even with my mission, my business changed. Like I'm, I'm thinking differently about money. I'm thinking differently about the work. I'm thinking differently about my time. And that's the thing, because my mission totally changed and is not self-oriented only, you know, like, of course, first you need to help yourself, I guess, if you agree with, my, with me, you need to help yourself first and your family. And after that, you can help the world. What yeah. do you think about that statement? <laughs> yeah, no, I think it's true. And that's the hardest part about it. And right, listen, this is right. I'm, I'm not smart. I've just made a lot of mistakes, right? Like this is the only reason I know to say these things because I've screwed up. I mean, early on in my entrepreneurial career, I would take anybody and everybody. Why? Because once again, it's like, hey, four kids to you know, so it's like, of course, when I started my business, I was much more, I took anybody that said yes, right? It's like anybody that, that was willing to pay me a little bit or a lot of it, sure, I don't know, you know, sign here, I'll figure it out later. And, and sometimes it worked out and sometimes I lost a lot of sleep and, and you know, some gray hairs, you know, because of it. Um, that's, so I, that is where I want to go. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just, you know, it, it's, it's, there's, you know, and I think sometimes you have to get it over your head, right? Like it's, you know, yeah. and, and here's the difficult thing, right? It's like, and, and this is what drives me crazy. You're going to make mistakes, right? You're going to make mistakes even if you try your best. Don't try to make mistakes so you can learn, though. I see so many people be like, well, I got to make the mistakes so I can learn. I'm going to do this dumb thing, even though I know it's dumb so I can learn. I'm like, whoa, where is it? Mistakes mean that, like, you thought you were doing something right and then you did it wrong. Like, purposely walking into it is stupid. <laughs> like, so, I, you know, even a lot of times, like, and there's been certain things where, you know, I've taken on clients and wanted to do, like, you know, retail stores online. I mean, even, even the product yeah. I took from Israel was a little bit over my head, you know, but I still, I, I took it. Um, but I learned a lot from doing it. But but those moments of like, you know, that, that pressure on your chest or on your back of diving in too deep. And then more importantly, you know, I, I a lot of people I work with, you know, they, they, they put it all on the line and they lost a lot too because of it. And it was difficult because it was like, we, we were all in it early on. A lot of the early stage things we did, and fortunately everybody recovered and came back. But like, you know, we've had some serious wins and we've had some serious losses. You know, I've, like I said, I've taken on that serious debt. I've almost yeah. lost my home. I've been through a lot of things. I, I would like there. to talk about that actually. Yeah, when, when yeah. I will just stop you there because I know it's always ups and downs. And uh, I, I always talk to people and that we talk so much about that great things, you know, what will happen. But I would like to actually dig in a little bit uh, deeper into like when you have really deep down, down, like what happened there? How did you feel? Like you said, you had some, you know, like a feeling on the chest and stuff. I really want to talk about that and how you overcome that. If you can think about situation or. 
Yeah, I think, you know, it's like anything else, right? Like going back to the diet analogy, right? It all works if you do it. But then also a lot of the times these things, like I can't tell you that it's like, hey, this one thing happened and it was the, then I realized like I screwed up really big one time. It was always like this gradual thing, right? You start taking out a little bit more debt, a little bit more on the credit card. You're paying for hosting on, on the credit card for the, you know, the software. You're, you're doing this, you're doing that. You know, you're, you're skipping a mortgage payment here and there in order to make sure the business runs it, you know. I'd love to tell you it was like one set thing, right? Or one set moment, but it was the moments where it's like all of a sudden it started to get, for me personally, the moments where it started to get, I would say this is like around probably about three or four years in doing this. Um, I started to, to see a change in who I was. I wasn't, I wasn't myself anymore. I was shorter tempered. Um, like I said, I'm the dancing in the chair guy, right? For me, that's really who I feel like I am. I try to be a little more funny. Like even when I left teaching, I left teaching because it wasn't fun anymore, you know? I knew I got my master's degree. I knew I wanted to do something else, but I didn't feel the, the, the immense joy as I did when I started. That's how I knew it was time to move. I think the mistakes I made in those pressures, it was, it was like, hey, wait a second. And even like a lot of the debt that I took out at, at certain points, I thought it would make the business and me feel better to not have that as a cloud over my head. Whereas not having the debt, not having the, you know, it, you know, and, and fortunately, like I said, mentioned before, I've had the opportunity to reorg businesses and things like that. Starting clean, you know, I'll never forget, I was in New York City and uh, went out and we were, we were having dinner with a client. Um, and, you know, the, the, my partner I was at the time went to the bathroom and I was talking to the client and I was like, he's like, oh, I got this. I said, are you sure? He goes, yeah. And I forget exactly what we said about something about paying the bill, but he goes, you know, he goes, I'm not in debt to anybody. He goes, and I don't want to be because he paid, I think he paid cash for the, that was the point, he paid cash for the dinner. He said, I'm not in debt to anybody and I don't want to owe anybody money. He goes, so if I can get into a business or I can get into something where I don't have to take on debt, I don't do it. And it was such a profound statement to me because he was very, one of the most, like in the middle of New York City, we were right off of Wall Street in a nice steakhouse. Like he was, uh, he was a lawyer actually, one of the most calmest guys I've ever met though, right? So like all, everything that you would think would be anti this kind of the, the, the environment that he was in lended more towards that. I guess stability, if you will, in 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 what you need to do. And that lesson was so hard for me because I always was in the you have to hustle, you have to sacrifice, you have to bleed for this, you have to put everything on the line. And sometimes, you know, and I guess I did, and it and it did help me succeed in certain other areas. But at the end of the day, is it you know, is it always necessary? No, you know. Um, but I but I think, like I said, I can't tell you a story of any one particular event because it was always like it was compounded, right? To where all of a sudden it's like, oh shit. Like, dead or oh shit you know i got i don't know if i can curse i apologize um <laughs> you know I, I you know these things have happened around myself to where like i had a, it was more on the times of like and then even the resets were gradual right because for me it was like okay well, like this isn't working and then like it was like looking at my partner i mean like is this really the route both of us want to go down and was, no i'm like all right i want to restructure um and redo the business and i started clean paid off the debts of the old business and then started the new business clean because that's what was important to me you know what i mean so so I think it's just a matter of, it's a balancing act, you know what I yeah. mean? It's a balancing act and you gotta, you, you really gotta realize you have to be so careful because it all happens so slowly, but it happens so quickly at the same time. Yeah. You know? I, I know um, what you're talking about. It, yeah. it, it, it's, it, it's, it's very, it, it, it's not easy. You know, it's not easy, especially in entrepreneurship. It's just, it's a slow burn. I mean, obviously, you know, the COVID situation, some people it's happened much quicker. It's accelerated that. But I think if you struggle during this, odds are the signs were there before and you just didn't want to see it. You yeah. know, I'm mean, not saying that's a blanket statement, but you know. Yeah. And I, and I think also the crisis and all that stuff, what is happening outside is still external thing. And I think most yeah. important, what you said, you know, like it's, it's about really asking yourself some questions because it's usually internal thing because a lot of people stay basically, I, I would say that they just freeze because of uh, COVID-19 or all that, you know, what was happening or what is happening in the world. But a lot of people find that, found that um, strength and, uh, you know, I, and they started to innovate and they started to do things. And it's all about where you are at personally. I guess it's more internal work because you said, like, you know, it's sometimes you're just talking to someone, you're, you're realizing that you're in debt and, and everything is going wrong, actually, and you're doing probably bad decisions. And and someone just, you know, tell you like, I'm not doing business if, if I should be in that, you know, or I, I'm not doing this because it's, that, that is how business shouldn't be done. And it's like one sentence sometimes from people and you're just waking up, you know, and implementing yeah. different things and you're changing your systems, you're changing everyday work just because yeah. one person said and maybe open your eyes. And I guess you are that kind of person that is always kind of realizing on time, probably like, uh, oh, this is not working. 
yeah. let's jump to something better or different. And, that, and that's been dumb luck, right? Like I can't, like, like sometimes it's just, you know, the right people at the right time or the right situations at the right time. And it's like the, the, the different yeses I've said, like even uh, my partner now, one of my partners on the marketing side of things, Leisha, who's with Granditos, is one of the company, her and I both kind of partner on the marketing side of things and I'm COO on her company. Um, she works with a lot of my clients as well in the magic group for the marketing side of things. But, you know, the, we met because I said yes to volunteer to be on the board of, you know, someone has to be on the board of their school. And I said, yes, and her and I met on that board. And it was just like, but if I didn't say yes to that free volunteer thing, or it's like, well, I'm, you know, I'm an education consultant. You should pay me to sit on that board or da, da, da. It was like, no, of course I'd volunteer to do that. You guys asked me, I'm humbled, I'm, I'm honored. And then I met somebody that I've been able to partner with and create a lot of business on. So sometimes it's not the immediate thing that's in front of you. But if I said no to the board, I would have never had this opportunity over here. Exactly. So, oh, that's great. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's just, you know, you have to be faithful in the process, you know, and, and you have to go with your gut and know what feels right and what feels wrong and what feels good and what feels bad. Because if it's, if it's always looking for the right next thing, you're always looking, you know, someone will say you always got to look for momentum. And, and Alicia says this all the time, which I love, she says, sometimes we got to slow down and speed up. And I, and I think you have to look at it and, you know, when you hit those roadblocks, whether it's financial, whether it's, you know, concept wise, whatever it may be, yeah. You know, and, and, you know, like, you know, we see, you know, tons of businesses, you know, I, I get around, you know, you, you look at some of the retail stores and you look at like DoorDash and, you know, food delivery and all these other things, you know, some of these businesses have tried, well, you kind of feel bad for them. Like they didn't get, you know, some of us got a little bit of downtime during the COVID thing, right? Because we didn't have to, like, I'm not on a plugging as much. I'm not, you know, in the office, I'll be more Zoom meetings. Like it, it, it freed my time up a little bit more. So yeah. I do think that, you know, you have to look at, what, what makes you tick and what makes you happy though, you know? Cause I don't think I could ever go to a nine to five job, but that doesn't mean a nine to five job is bad, right? Like, like I think that's what we have. Like, exactly. That's what we have yeah. Like, they're like, oh, like, like how could people that mean that? I know? Like, first of all, I think it's the stupidest thing when entrepreneurs say they, they like hate the nine to five. Cause it's like, listen, if you ever become a successful entrepreneur, you're going to be hiring a lot of nine to fivers. So you better <laughs> say, like I say nice things about nine to fivers all the time because as my businesses grow, those are the people. And there's some people that have amazing lives going into work at nine and leaving at five. Yeah. I, believe me, I wish I could be in that mindset. But it just, yeah. it yes, it that would be so easy. Me. It doesn't suit me. And, and, and even like when, when the entrepreneurship stuff got hard, I said to my wife at one point, I'm like, this is just getting hard. I'm like, maybe I should go back to teaching. And she looked at me, she said, why would you do that? She goes, even when you taught, she goes, you stay up all night and planned your lessons for the next day and you did extracurricular activities yeah. and you, you coached and you did, you, know, you did all this different stuff. Um, no, I was never a sports coach, but I, I uh, led retreats and, you know, did a lot of different things. So, um, you know, she says, why, you know, just keep putting in the effort you're doing and you'll get there. And she was right. You know what I mean? She's like, don't, don't feel like you have to give up and go back because you know, you're just going to work just as hard wherever you go, work hard on what makes you happy. And the results will come. Yeah. And even when I taught, like everyone's like, oh, teachers don't get paid enough and they don't, right? Like, I'm not here to debate or argue that, but I will say when I was a teacher, like, I was like, I can't believe they're paying me for this stuff. Like, are they seriously <laughs> paying me to, like, do this job? This is a blast. And I was still able to, like, during, this was during 2008 when the economy was bad here in the United States. Yeah. I was able to buy my first home with my wife, right? Like, we were both teachers. We were both able to buy the home in the neighborhood we wanted to live in. We didn't have to sacrifice that. Why? Because things just lined up because we were doing the right thing. We, knew, we were where we were supposed to be. We were teaching. We were working hard. We are making enough money that in a down economy, we could buy our dream home. Coincidence, maybe, but 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 that's what I mean. Being on the right path, and then it was you know nine years later, you know we we ended up having our third kid. We bought enough. We were able to buy a bigger home. We we're in a financial place to do that. You know why? Because I was working hard. I was doing what I was supposed to be doing. I was working the business I was supposed to be. Yeah. I was able to get that home, and then we were able to have a fourth kid. Fortunately, good thing we got the bigger house. Um, <laughs> so it's just about it's yeah. just about consistently being on that path and just having the faith in what you're doing. And, and like I said, it's more about doing the work than it is making the money. If you do the work, the money will come. But if the money's not coming when you're doing the work, you have to adjust. That, it's that simple, right? It's exactly. That. <laughs> I really, I'm, I'm so happy actually you mentioned that uh, nine to five jobs because I was actually having that discussion last time. I think that was with my partner and I said, look, I don't understand when people are making advertisement on social media and they said, you want to leave your nine to five job. <laughs> and I said, you're never going to leave it when you're starting the business. It's just yeah. not happening. I'm working from 5 a.m. Oh, okay, I have my rituals and stuff that I'm doing in the morning. But yeah. I'm usually working at around 7. 7 is when I'm starting my computer. And it's 7 to 6. It's 7 to 8 sometimes. It's sometimes it's less. But I can choose. But the point is I'm working more or more hours yeah. than I was working for someone else. You know, Because 9 to 5 job is easy. That was easy. But I just didn't enjoy it because there was no stimulation for me. 
There was, yeah, it was yeah. not because I wanted to work less. And this is what people need to understand because if you, I will never advertise that because I know I will get the clients they are lazy. I don't want my clients, they are not committed and they are not actually prepared to put so much hard work into business because that business is never going to happen. And yeah. people are like, yeah, leave your nine to five and have amazing life. That's not going to happen. No, and, and listen, if you're passionate about, you know, milk, milkshakes or whatever it is they're selling, you know, you may, you may make a million dollars and be able to leave your nine to five. You may be able to make a hundred grand a year, but, it, but it's also too, what's the goal of leaving that, right? Like, yeah. cause it's easy. I tell, I tell people, it's easy to replace an 80, 90, a hundred thousand dollars your salary. That's not difficult to do, yeah. right? You can leave your job and do that. It's sustaining that. that is yes, right? exactly. Like it's sustaining that and growing that and knowing what the end game is, right? And you're, and you're nine to five where you're making a hundred grand a year. There's a sustainable plan to keep you in that job for 20 to 25 years. That's yeah. why they give you retirement plans, right? So Which, true. It's not hard to find something else to do on the side to, to get out of that, generate 100 grand a year. But are you going to be able to do that for 25, 30, 40 years till you're ready to retire? Yeah. You know what I mean? And will that job also sustain you in retirement? That's the hard part, right? That's what most people That's don't understand. You know what I mean? That's what most people don't get. And, and believe me, somebody like my, my sister has a nine to five and her husband's a, a, a police officer. They're set for life. He's got a great pension. She's got a great job with a pension. They work nine to five. They work hard and both of them work very hard. But for them to become entrepreneurs as if it's going to give them the financial yeah. freedom they want, that's not true. Yeah. That's not true for them. You know what I mean? It's just not. It's just not going yeah. to happen. Yeah. It's harder on them. I can tell my sister, I'm like, you should go. She, she works in the news. I'm like, you should go be a, a, a PR consultant on the side. She's like, no, I'm good. She's like, I love where I am. I love what I do. It fits what she's doing. And if you go to her and you'd be like, oh, aren't you tired of your nine to five? You're working for the man. You know, I'm sorry that the three or four vacations she takes a year makes her happy. You know what I mean? Yeah. The car, the house she lives in, she's happy. It's people are trying to sell other people their dreams instead of asking people what, what, what are, uh, what are, are their own dreams, right? Like people are trying to say, I want you to buy into my dream instead of asking them, what is your dream? You know what I mean? Not everyone's dream is a Bentley and a yacht and a plane and, a, and an island. Yes. Yeah, so it's, so it's, true. It's, yeah. It's, it's just, and, and I think the entrepreneurial community has to embrace that a little bit more, you know? And I think they are, right? It's becoming much more humble. I think people are yeah. getting that. Um, but it's just, you know, it, it, it's understanding like what financial freedom really is and what wealth is are two completely different I, things. Yeah. I, I think you it's, know? yeah, I think also like this podcast and, and my live events or anything what I, what I do with people, I, I guess I can see it's very important because I think it's very important to show people the truth the truth about business, about sales, about marketing and connect them with people and understand what actually business is because it's so many, like social media changed that you probably noticed. There's so many offers okay. and so many people talking about this amazing entrepreneur and entrepreneur journey and, and being a business owner, how, how amazing it is. Like you have so much freedom and you have, it's, it's not really true at the beginning. And that's what it is, you know, like to, to honestly, to find someone who will replace you and will do your job to get that freedom. That's the hardest part. Yeah. I hired so many people to do just social media or just do digital marketing or, or just do like assistance and yeah. stuff. I, I, I changed so many people because that was just nothing that I was expecting. And I, I was very clear on what I expect, but yeah. it's just not happening because you can't trust anyone more than yourself first at the first point with your business. Because who is, and, and you need to find and train that person. And I guess that has to be, again, a relationship and all that stuff. Yeah. And it's, it's pretty, well, it's pretty tough out there. It's not it, just. And, it, and, it, and it's not just, and a lot of people, I think, you know, and, and you hit on a great point, right? Like, like you, as an entrepreneur, like no one will do whatever business you start, right? No one will do it as good as you do. So what's the first thing in, in growing that business is, is duplicating yourself, right? Yeah. But understanding that, that when you make a copy of something, right? If I make a copy of a piece of paper on a copy machine, which I know is like getting kind of archaic, it doesn't come out as clear as the original, right? So you have to decide what are you going to do to make, you know, how are you going to train that person? That's the first thing. Yes. But what are you willing to, where you would give it 110%, what are you willing to give up 20, 30% so that's done at least 80 to, you know, 70 to 80% capacity, yeah. it's still okay. And I think that's the hardest part for entrepreneurs to let go is they only see they're giving 110%, the person's doing it at 80, they only see the 30% that's missing. And yes. sometimes you have to be okay with that 30% burn off. You have to be okay that, hey, if I was doing this, I would have maybe put an extra smiley face on the email and they didn't do that. Okay, you just got to let that go because now <laughs> it's going to buy you more time to grow the base of your business and do what you need to do. And, and that's hard. That's so hard to let go as an entrepreneur because you take this baby and you're like, you know, oh man, like I built this, like, and now I'm going to let this person manage my social media account. It's like, 
you're saying excited too many times. It's, it's so hard to let go of that, right? But so no, that smiley face I'm is okay no with it not being 110%. I'm okay with it being 80, but now I have more time to, to, to build the tribe that I need over here or to yeah. do the webinar I need to do. So it's, it's a tough one, super yeah, tough one. Yeah, and it's, it's compromise. It, it's compromising and also see the good thing in other people, other person, and I think that's very important. But that's, again, a long story. We will talk probably another few hours for oh, uh, yeah, Mali, no, and about trainings, about leadership. But yeah, I will, I will probably ask you at the end because I don't want to take more of your time. What you will say to audience, like if you can tell them something they can take or implement or take away uh, to get better business or life, what it would be? I think it's just, you know, pick the one thing you could do to help your business grow and be consistent at it, right? Like if you're going to say for the next, you know, the, the next six months going in the second half of this year, right? We should look at June 1st as like New Year's part two. Um, if you're going to say, hey, I want to see my business grow, pick one thing you could do that makes you happy, that's going to help your business grow and be consistent at it. Whether it's cold calling, whether it's posting to social media, if you're like, hey, I'm going to, you know, I, I'm terrible at posting to social media, right? And marketing people say this all the time. Oh, my social media page is the worst, but we're the best marketers in the world. Well, then commit to put, doing one post a week. Commit to something, one thing that's going to allow your business to grow, but be consistent at it for the next six months. I would say set that goal for yourself and, and you'd be amazed at the results. That's great advice. Thank you very much. And uh, please let us know where we can find you, where we can find Mike. Um, yeah, uh, really easy. Mike Ficarra. So M-I-K-E-F-I-C-A-R-A.com is the best way to find me. Mike Ficarra on all social media uh, is the easiest way to locate me. And the magusgroup.com is the business as well. Cool. Thank you very much for your time. It was my pleasure to talk to you today. No, thank you. This was fun. This was fun. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. All right. Talk to you soon. Bye.